Hello, cool people, and welcome to lecture four of our amazing computational physics, physics 352 course at Northwestern. And I am your amazing instructor, Sasha Chikovskoy. Let us start with a few reminders. First of all, most of the examples that uh, we use in lectures are available in the examples directory that you can uh, peruse. You can take uh, the source codes from this examples directory, copy it to your home directory or to your dedicated uh, shared directory in the uh, project E2027271 uh, student slash your net ID, which you can create yourself. Uh, and then you can compile and run uh, and debug the software. You, of course, are also very welcome to use your own laptop if you have Linux working on it. Uh, you can always uh, find out which part uh, of the file system you are by typing pwd enter the present working directory. Please note that I myself oftentimes uh, make a mistake and uh, when I compile the code, I accidentally overwrite the source code with the executable itself. So instead of uh, typing that, I actually type this. So what we actually want is type something like that. So the executable name is different than the name of the program itself. But if you accidentally did run something like this, uh, then you will overwrite the source code with the executable. And then if you're using Emacs, then you might be just as well saved. Because if Emacs window is still open, uh, you can recover the source code uh, from that window by saving it again back uh, into the original source code file. So just be careful when you are doing compilations. And this is yet another example of why you might want to use version control such as Git. Uh, please go back to lecture one and two where I give links to the tutorials where you can learn how to use version control. That way, even if you accidentally overwrite the source code, you can always uh, restore it from the version control system. Then we're going to discuss floating point arithmetic and how to properly compare two floating point numbers. Just on equality is not always good enough. And then we're going to move on to the point arithmetic, where we will discuss what actually happens when you increment or decrement a pointer. What uh, is the corresponding memory in the uh, memory stack um, to that changed pointer? And we will also consider an updated version of pointarithmetic.c, which is sitting in example slash lecture three. Finally, as a reminder, homework number one is due this Tuesday, a minute before midnight, that is at 11.59 p.m. Please do not miss this deadline. We are eagerly awaiting, your, awaiting for your submissions. The first question that we're going to try and address is how to compare two floating point numbers to each other. The question at issue is whether sine of pi is zero. Of course we know sine of pi should be zero, but is it zero to numerical precision? And that is how we're going to test this. Uh, let us include uh, the standard input output in the standard math library, just so we can call uh, both print functions and mathematical functions. We're going to uh, announce or declare variable f, that will be floating point variable, that we will assign to the value of sine of pi, that one. And m underscore pi is the standard uh, constant that is defined in math.h, so that is just pi. So if we print out the value of sine of pi, uh, will it be exactly zero? Probably not because numerical evaluation of a sine function as any mathematical function is not exact and there could be some round of error and we're going to see just how it works. And then what we're going to do is we're going to compare uh, the output to zero uh, and uh, we'll see whether the output is actually zero. So as you can see, the value is just a tad different than zero by one part in 10 to the 16. But that is enough for the compiler to decide that Hmm, it's not actually zero. So how do we compare two numbers, two floating point numbers, 
in a way that gives us a robust answer, whether the two numbers, in this case f and 0, are the same or not, in a way that doesn't depend on these uh, uh, machine level inaccuracies. So, for instance, we would like to have sine of pi be 0 to within some tolerance. And so to recap, what we've done here is we've used uh, uh, the statement if f, which is equivalent to if f not equal to 0. Remember, anything other than 0 is true. And so if f uh, is equivalent to this, if it's non-zero, it's true. And therefore, if it is even a tad different than 0, then if f will be true. And therefore, it won't be exactly 0. So comparing two floating point numbers to each other is dangerous, depending on the implementation, depending on the type of compiler, depending on the math libraries, depending on the hardware architecture. You can get different answers for sine of pi. If you try it, you can get different uh, answers on your laptop. And so how do we write our C code in a way that is platform independent? That is, in a way that sine of pi will always be the same as zero. So for that, we will always need to leave room for round of error. Namely, comparison of A to B using the equality is not a good idea. Much better is to leave some tolerance. So we're going to take a difference between two floating point variables, take the absolute value, which is what fapps function does, and we're going to demand uh, that the difference is less than 10 times the machine precision that is made possible by the double uh, format of the floating point values. That is precisely what dbl underscore epsilon is. It is defined in flow.h and on my machine it is 2.2 times 10 to the minus 16 which is very close to this. Not surprisingly uh, that's roughly the magnitude of the round of error that we experience when we compute uh, something that is supposed to be zero but ends up not being quite that. So that value of dbl epsilon is the smallest number that is resolvable uh, within numerical precision relative to unity. Uh, so uh, the definition of that number is that 1 plus dbl underscore epsilon is not equal to 1 but 1 plus dbl epsilon over 2 will be equal to 1. So if you add anything that's smaller than that number to 1, you will get 1 back. The machine cannot tell these two numbers apart. So literally dbl epsilon is the smallest number you can hope to resolve relative to 1 uh, within the machine precision. Uh, a quick question for you uh, to work out on your own is how would you compute this number dbl underscore epsilon if you didn't have access to flow.h where it is given for you. Now we're going to take a look at the address of an array. So far when we define the address of an array we have basically looked at the address of the first element of the array or in this example it would have been just a that is the address of the zeroth element of the array. However, what happens if we take the address of A and print it out in addition to A? And this is what we're going to find. The two addresses are identical. Namely, the address of an array is the array itself. But before we go on and make sense of what that means and how that can be, let us uh, try and uh, take a look at the notation of the address here because it starts with this weird combination 0x blah blah blah. So what's that? That is no magic. This is a hexadecimal or hex base 16 notation where 1 is 0x1 all the way through 9 which would be 0x9 but then we're running out of numbers and so we're going to switch to letters because this is a base 16 notation so there's going to be 16 digits and so digit number 10 will be a and so on and so forth through 0xf which encodes the number 15 and once we move on to the next uh, 
value, which is 16, it will be encoded as 0x10. Now we're in a position to figure out what's going on here, why the two addresses are the same. And the answer lies in the fact that a and ampersand a, although they have the same value, they have different types. a is a pointer to a single character, and its type is char star. ampersand a is a pointer to the entire set of 16 characters or the entire 16 byte long array and if we wanted to create a pointer uh, equal to ampersand a we would have to define it like this it is a pointer to an array of 16 elements of type char so how does it work with a regular uh, pointer to a character suppose we define char star p or care star p and in this case p will be pointer to a character its type is care star ampersand p is a pointer to that pointer so it's a pointer to a care star so its type is going to be care star star so let us now try and compare how both ways of referring to memory going to behave in practice here is an example where we define two identical um, expressions in memory, but use an array to define one and use a pointer to define the other. In both cases, they point to a string, don't you worry, which has, not surprisingly, exactly 16 elements. Don't you worry is 15 elements plus the terminating zero character will be the 16th element. Now we're going to print out the value of A and its address. And we will do uh, the same, but for the next element of uh, A array. And we're going to add one to the address of A. We're going to do the same thing for P and ampersand P. And this is what we end up with. Not surprisingly, when we add 1 to a, we're going to have uh, the value incremented by 1. We are going to get the same exact for p. However, the differences come when we try to take a look at the address that we get when we print the value of ampersand a plus 1. You see here that the address got incremented by an entire 16 bytes whereas in the case of p it got incremented by just 8. Why is there such a difference? Well it's because ampersand a is the address of the um, of an array of 16 characters and when we add one to it, we're going to jump forward in memory to the next element, which will be another array of 16 characters. And therefore, we have to hop over by 16 characters in memory. That is precisely why uh, the address hop by 16 characters. Whereas here, we are going to hop from uh, one pointer to char star to the next pointer uh, of type char star. And the size of pointer char star is 8 bytes. Therefore, we're going to jump just by those 8 bytes. That's because ampersand p is the address of uh, a variable of type char star. So if we add 1 to the address to go to the next variable, we're going to hop by the number of bytes that is needed to store that variable of type char star which is precisely 8 bytes, at least on my system. So hopefully this clarifies the differences uh, between the addresses of an array uh, and the addresses of a pointer. Please let me know if you have any questions about this, because I know this can be confusing, and that's why I want 
to discuss this with you. Now, let us try and wrap up the mysteries of pointers here uh, by updating the point arithmetic.c. This is an example file that you can download from the examples of a previous lecture, lecture 3. So you can go to quest example slash lecture 3 slash point arithmetic.c. And what we're doing here is we're modifying the example that we used in the lecture uh, to try and play around with pointers of different types and assigning them to each other. So, as before, we define that the array size has four elements. Uh, we're going to uh, assign those four elements, and they're going to be 1, 22, 333, and 444. So far, it's exactly the same as the point arithmetic, that example that we considered last time. However, here, instead of just saying in star bar equal to foo, we're going to use a bar pointer of a different type. We're going to, for instance, use unsigned lawn type, which is twice as large in memory as integer. Uh, so that will introduce really finicky behavior. And that's the behavior that I wanted to discuss with you so that if you encounter it, you won't be surprised. So we will also introduce a variable, temporary variable, of the same type. We're doing that in order to evaluate the number of bytes that the variable takes up in memory. And uh, uh, when we do that, we're going to see that the size of this unsigned lawn variable is 8 bytes. That is twice as large as the size of an integer. Integer is 4 bytes on typical systems. So now there's going to be a surprise. We're going to uh, perform the same loop as before, uh, but now we're going to see that instead of printing all of the four variables of uh, all the four elements of the array, uh, the loop will print out only two, only every other element of the array. Why is this happening? What's going on? Did those two other elements disappear? Or is there another reason that this loop, uh, which is uh, uh, going through all the elements of the bar array, uh, which is, should be as good as the foo array, is skipping every other variable? So it has something to do with the different size of the variable uh, to which a bar points. And uh, that is where the answer is hidden. So try and talk to each other uh, during the office hackathon hours in the breakout rooms and try and decide, uh, figure out what is the origin uh, of half of the elements of the array missing. Now is the final topic that I wanted to discuss, the final follow-up and namely the stack smashing protection. And that has to do with the assignment 1.3, uh, that is the third question in assignment one. And uh, thanks to Valeria for bringing this issue up with me. It turns out that the latest versions of the GNU compiler, GCC, have protection specifically aimed at eliminating the stack smashing. That is, when you try to write out of bounds of the memory that you have uh, access to. And uh, that protection turns out to be turned on by default. And so when you define uh, arrays A and B as the question asks you to do, and try and write out of bounds of the array B, you might see, uh, once you run the software, once you run your program, an error message, something like this, regular output plus this. And this indicates that GCC actually does have the stack smashing protection on. Uh, it detects the fact that you try to write out of bounds of the array B and prevents that write from happening. This prevents uh, the corruption of memory or the overwrite of memory of array A as would happen had this feature not been enabled. So this is a really awesome safety feature and that can help uh, you to avoid your code from being hacked. Uh, in order to test it for the purposes of just this assignment, you can temporarily disable this protection uh, by adding the following switch or command line argument, minus fno minus stack minus protection. 
switch. So you type GCC, uh, the switch, and then the rest of the command. And uh, this is where uh, the suggestion is coming from. Uh, if you are uh, unsure what's going on, you can always Google the error that comes out. And this is one of the first few hits. Stack Overflow is a really good resource where a lot of such technical questions have been asked by people who uh, have encountered them. And uh, if you disable this feature, uh, the stack protection, uh, then you will be able to write out of bounds of array B, override the contents of array A, and you will actually see how that works. And by printing out the addresses of the individual elements, you will be able to piece together what actually is happening when you write out of bounds. If you have any questions about that, please let me know. I'm more than happy to discuss the details. Now we get into the material that I would like to discuss. Namely, we will start uh, with the structures, move on to pointers and arrays with structures, and then we're going to discuss linking, uh, the plotting with Python and GNU plot with a little bit more bells and whistles. Namely, we'll discuss how to label uh, various axes because that's pretty useful. If you share a plot with someone, it's nice when the axes are labeled. And it's just good to try and review how to plot things. So let us start with uh, an example of when uh, we call our software and provide some arguments to it. And that's good because then you don't have to recompile the software if you would like uh, to run it for various values of certain variables. So for that, uh, we can uh, change the syntax of the main function so that it accepts command line arguments. And the convention here is to give it two arguments, one of an integer type and the other one of a pointer to a character pointer. So rgk is the argument count. How many arguments did you pass to the function? And it will be filled in automatically uh, once you uh, get into main. And rgv is the array of the variables that were passed in the command line. And it will have rgk number of elements. This is an array of strings. That's why there are two stars in there. It's a pointer to pointer to character, or it's a pointer to a string. And rgv0, the very zeroth argument, is always the name of the executable, followed by the rest of the arguments. So let's take a look at it, how this performs in practice. So let's uh, consider this uh, simple software uh, where we are going to initialize the main function just as we discussed with two arguments, rgk and rgv. We're going to uh, introduce the integer variable and initialize it with zero. Uh, we're going to print the number of arguments, the argument count, and then we're going to loop over all of the arguments, and we're going to print the index of the argument and the value of the argument. This is the output for uh, running uh, our program uh, with five arguments, A, B, C, D, E. And you see that there are six elements in the RGV array uh, because RGK is equal to six. And you can see that there are six outputs. The zeroth output is the name of the executable, or if we count it from one, it's the first output. And then the rest are the arguments that we gave uh, to our program when we run it. Hopefully this makes sense. Let me know if you have questions. The next topic that we would like to discuss is the super exciting topic of structures. And that is because oftentimes you can't quite get away with your algorithms when you are restricted to the basic C types like integers, floats, doubles, and so on. It sometimes is useful uh, to uh, group uh, your variables uh, into uh, something bigger, into some bigger structure. Hence, the structures which they allow you to do that. And for instance, 
we can lump together the date and the temperature from the Chicago weather data set that we used a few times in the previous lectures. So let us try and uh, get a sense of how the structures work. You declare them with the keyword struct, then you provide an optional name uh, that you uh, refer to the structure with, and then you uh, declare the members of the structure within the braces. In this case, we will have two members, integer foo and a float bar. And very important, of course, you need to put a semicolon at the end uh, because the whole thing is a statement and statements are separated uh, with semicolons. You can define structures in uh, different ways. So, uh, for instance, if you would like to declare an instance of a structure, like an actual variable, uh, then you can use uh, the previously defined structure foobar in the following way, struct foobar, and then you give the name of the instance that you would like to create, in this case, foo struct. You can also initialize the values of the structure uh, directly uh, while initializing it. So, for instance, you could uh, uh, directly initialize it by uh, listing the values um, as comma separated values uh, enclosed in braces. Don't forget the semicolon at the end. However, we programmers are sometimes getting tired of typing all of these keywords, struck, blah, blah, blah. So uh, what we do is we oftentimes can define shortcuts when working with these complex variable types. So uh, one way is uh, we can use the type def command. Uh, what this does is it says that um, this whole thing uh, can be equivalently represented by simply typing my foo struct. Or you can even drop uh, the name of the type of the structure and simply type type def struct the list of members and then the name of uh, that, that you would like to use to refer uh, to this type of structure. Uh, so here is an example of how you can use all of that and how you can access the members of the structure. So we're going to uh, include the standard input output library header. Uh, we're going to include the foo struct.h header where all of the structure information is defined. And uh, we're going to define an instance foo of our uh, structure my foo struct that we defined on the previous slide and uh, which code is sitting inside of foo struct. We can then access the member variables bar and foo bar uh, inside structure instance foo uh, by using the dot. And so then we will say foo.bar is equal to 2021 and foo.foobar is equal to pi. And we can, we can then print each of these variables in the same way. And we, of course, will get uh, printed out the variable that we have assigned. We can also make an array of structure objects, just like you can do with any other type found in the C language. And we can also use static initialization like we did before for a single um, structure object. But here we can use nested lists. So you can see that we will define an array of my foo structs. Uh, the C compiler will figure out how many elements there will be. And then we will define the, the values of the first element and the values of the second element, uh, where we just use the same notation, um, comma separated values enclosed in curly braces. And then to separate the uh, different elements in this array, we're just going to use commas. Then we can loop over all of these uh, um, two, in this case, elements of the uh, structure array. So we'll go from zero to, uh, and then we're actually going to compute the number of elements there so that this works in general. Size of foo will tell us how many bytes the entire array weighs. 
and we're going to define it by the weight or by the size of a single uh, element of that array or the number of bytes that the structure takes up. So this will tell us how many elements the array consists of and we're going to increment i at the end of each loop iteration. So when we print out the values, we will not surprisingly get whatever we assign them to be. Uh, for instance, the zeroth element of our array will have 20, 20 and pi, uh, just like we assigned, and the next one will be 2021 20, and 2.91, uh, whatever uh, that uh, variable is assigned to. We can also use pointers with structures, and uh, uh, this is how we can do that. We can um, initialize, or we can declare a pointer to my foo struct uh, and name that pointer as foo. And we can access uh, the member variables of uh, that structure uh, by uh, first dereferencing the pointer uh, and then uh, accessing it in the usual way using the dot. However, there is uh, a more convenient shortcut by using a right arrow which you type by uh, typing minus sign and then greater than sign. So this is how you can access the member variables of a function when you have its pointer foo. So foo uh, minus sign greater than bar is the way that you can access to a bar variable uh, of a structure to which foo points. This is how we can use structures in order to create linked lists. Uh, linked lists are um, arrays where each element knows where the next one is located. So this is a convenient data structure uh, when you would like to have an array into which you can insert or from which you can remove the elements then you don't actually have to copy um, the array to close the hole or to open up a hole. Uh, all you need to do is to change the values of a couple of pointers. So here is how we can define an element uh, of uh, a, such uh, an array, and that will be a structure. And what's really cool is that a structure can point to itself or to an instance of the same type as a structure. So first we define bar struct instance, my bar struct, and this is how we can define my bar struct. Uh, it will consist of bar, foo bar, and the pointer to the next element in our linked list, which has the same type uh, as uh, bar struct. So here is an example of how we can use linked lists. Uh, we're going to define the size of the array, which will have 10 elements in our case. Here is our array declaration. And we're now going to loop over all the elements. Uh, we're going to uh, refer to the individual elements using the pointer arithmetic. So foo plus zero is going to be the address of the first uh, element in the array. Foo plus one will be the address of the first element in the array and so on. So foo plus i will be the address of the ith element in our array of structures, this one. Then uh, we can access the member variable of that array element by using the right arrow shorthand and we can assign it to whatever we want. In this case we're going to assign it to the index of that variable i and now we will be able to assign the pointer to the next uh, element in the linked list, uh, which will be uh, foo plus i plus 1, the next element. Foo plus i is the address of the current element, and plus 1 points to the next element. Uh, finally, what we need to do is to make sure uh, that there is a way for us uh, to indicate that uh, that is the last element, there is nothing else. So typically such pointers which point to nowhere, because there is no uh, elements past the last one is simply uh, simply set to null. So if you encounter a null pointer, it means it's not a good idea uh, to evaluate its value, uh, or else you will get a memory access error 
and your program will crash. Uh, so that's definitely something that you want to do if you think that a, there is a possibility that a pointer that you would like to evaluate is a null pointer, first you check is null equal to this pointer and if yes then you don't do anything with it because it points to nowhere but if it is not null then you can go ahead and do something with it uh, which presents another problem if the pointer is not initialized and points to some random place in memory there is no way for you to know if that place in memory actually uh, is uh, is random or it's the one that uh, has been allocated for you so that is yet another example of the dangers of working with pointers so when you create your software be very careful and make sure that you avoid accessing memory that doesn't belong to you so here we're going to uh, declare a pointer uh, to my bar struct and we're going to uh, loop over uh, the elements in our array starting uh, with the zeroth element and uh, we're going to keep looping while the pointer is non-null right the last one will be null but if it's not null it means that there are more elements and uh, at the end of the iteration we're going to uh, update the pointer to point to the next element in our array of structures and we're going to print out uh, the value of bar or in this case it will be set to the index of uh, the current structure index in the array so what we're doing here is we are initializing our array uh, we are making sure that each pointer knows about the next each element knows about the next element so uh, if I'm element I I will know, I will have the pointer to element i plus 1. Uh, so that's precisely what we're doing here. And finally, we're going to walk through our elements in the array of structures, but we're not going to be looping them by incrementing i like we did here. We're now going to be using the linked list. Uh, that is, we're going to start with uh, the pointer to the zeroth element in the array, which is foo. And once we know that, all we need to do is to keep going while the pointer is not null, and the next pointer will be given us to by by the next uh, by the variable called next that is a member variable of our uh, structure, uh, and then we're going to be able to access that variable uh, using the shorthand uh, the right the right arrow shorthand. Uh, the output of this uh, program is as expected. We're going to loop over all of the 10 elements of this array uh, from 0 to 9 and it's going to print out all the values of the elements. You can play around and you can find a way how to remove elements from the array. So for instance, uh, you could uh, go to element 2 of the array and set the pointer to point directly to element 4. That way the element 3 will be removed. So that shows the flexibility of linked lists where you can remove the elements or if you would like to insert an element between these two uh, you could try and uh, point element 3 to the element that you want to insert and then point that element's pointer uh, to element 4 and that way you will be able to insert an element between uh, the items 3 and 4 here. As always if you have questions about linked lists or point arithmetic please come and talk to me or Lindsay. Now it's time to discuss um, the difference between structures and objects because some of you uh, may have uh, had experience with C++ or other object-oriented languages and uh, those work with objects which seem to be tantalizingly similar to the structures that we just introduced. However, uh, although both of these types, structures and objects, uh, they are uh, convenient ways of bundling information uh, together, there is a crucial difference. Objects uh, not only include the information or the data, they also include member functions or methods to operate on that data. So data comes with functions or methods to work on that data uh, you, when you use objects. 
whereas structures, they do not provide the functions. They just have the data. So you would have to create functions separately and then call them to operate on the data. So this shows the advantages of object-oriented programming. We're not going to go there in this computational physics course. However, if you're interested, please reach out to me. I'm happy to point you to resources that will uh, give you uh, information about uh, C++ and how to learn it. There are nice tutorials online. And uh, you're welcome, if you know C++, to use it uh, for writing the assignments. However, please do so only if you feel fluent in the C language, because hopping directly to C++ actually prevents you from getting a feel of how C++ works under the hood, uh, because C++ is a huge building on top of C. And if you hop a few stories uh, to C++, you will kind of miss out on the fundamentals of how C++ works. So now we're going to move to the last topic of today, namely object files and linking. And in this case, we are mean objects not in the object-oriented sense, but rather in a sense of compilation. So the idea here is uh, uh, how to make the program more modular. So for instance, so far, uh, typically we have bundled all the code into one single C file. Well, that actually is technically true, even if we uh, used header files if we uh, to uh, include the headers or to include the implementations, because the preprocessor uh, on the pre-compilation stage would have pulled the data from all those header files and dumped it into our uh, main file. So that is actually not something that you would like to do when you have a complex software. Uh, you don't want to put all of the uh, functionality, all of the program into one file because it will become very long and difficult to manage. Uh, besides, uh, it is super nice when you modularize the functionality. Uh, separate the physics into one file, graphics into another, input output into a third one, and I'm just giving you the most basic example, but you're getting the idea. So if you want to make a small modification to one function, you don't want to recompile the entire file, uh, which contains the, the, all the functions. If you break them up into smaller pieces, into smaller files, you will only have to recompile the file within which that function is defined. Uh, and that speeds up uh, your work. You can also um, reuse your code because once you create a file for one project, you can uh, use the same file for a different one. Let us see how this approach works. You are going to separate your functions into distinct source and header files. You're going to compile each of these uh, source files into object files separately one object file for one source file. You are not going to be building an executable here uh, because there's no main function inside of these uh, most of the C files. There will be only one main function for all of these files. And objects without main functions, they won't run by themselves. In order to run them, you will have to link all of these files together uh, and uh, one of these files will contain the main file. And that is how the whole program will run. To run something requires you to define a main function. So this is how it uh, works uh, in a pictorial way. So you will uh, have a header file uh, that uh, defines various things and declares various functions. So here we uh, define a macro foo that is a stand-in for hello world. Uh, we are declaring our function, uh, say hello, and that is all sitting inside of hello.h. Um, this uh, hello.h is going to be included into a, one of our source files, hello.c, uh, through include hello.h in quotes. Uh, this hello.c is going to contain the definition of the function, say hello, which prints out uh, our hello world.
message. We're also going to include the hello.h file into another C file. This one actually contains the main function. And it is this main function that will make a call to our say hello function, which is define in hello.c uh, file. So you see that our uh, software now is spread over three different files, a header file and two C files. How are we going to make it all work together? We're going to compile the first C file uh, into an object file, hello.o, o stands for object. We're going to then compile main.c into its own object, main.o. And then we're going to link both of them into the executable main.exe. This is the one executable that we actually will be able to run. So the procedure to do that step by step is as follows. First, let us create a directory called hello. Then let us create subdirectories, uh, src and include. So we're going to create hello directory, src and include subdirectories. Then we're going to move our C files to src subdirectory and header files to include subdirectory. So we're going to move hello into hello slash src and hello.h into hello slash include. And then, oh, and we're keeping main outside because that's the main function that will call the rest. So now, if we list uh, recursively the contents of our uh, directory, we're going to see that uh, at the top level, there is our main C file. There is a subdirectory called hello, which in itself contains two subdirectories, include and source subdirectories. The include one contains the header file that we're going to be include everywhere. And the source directory contains the actual source of uh, our uh, hello function. So now let's go to uh, the hello directory. And we're going to compile our hello.c. We will have to include the path of the header file with minus i, which stands for include. And we're going to also use the minus C switch in order to instruct GCC to not link our um, uh, not not link our result of compilation. Just stop at the compilation itself. The result will be an object .o file. So when we run GCC minus I include minus C. Uh, our source file, we're going to end up with uh, an object file, hello.o, that this compilation command has produced. We can't quite yet run it because there is no main function, which we will get to now. Let us now go one level up, and we're going to try and compile a main function. When we try to do that, it will complain because it doesn't know where to find hello.h, uh, the header file that we include in, in main.c. And that is because when we include a file in, single, in quotes, it only tries to look for it in the current directory. So uh, we will uh, try and teach it where to look for this file. So we're going to um, teach it by listing the include directory path um, using the minus i switch. Then we're going to tell the compiler which uh, file we're going to compile. And we're going to tell it what is the output name that we want. And even that won't quite work. And that's because the compiler, uh, actually the linker, doesn't know uh, where our hello uh, function is sitting it needs to know where the object file lives. And that's precisely what it complains about. It doesn't know where the implementation of say hello function is located. And it will return uh, an error. So in order to teach it that, we're going to uh, provide the full path to the object file that contains the implementation of say hello function. And once we do that, uh, hopefully if everything works correctly, we're going to see no error messages anymore. 
uh, and uh, there will be an executable main.exe generated. And once we run it in the regular way, dot forward slash main.exe, we're going to get the long awaited hello world uh, print message. However, all of this is not how we typically use um, object files. Typically, there are many object files if you have multiple C files in your software and you can compile them in this way. But oftentimes, what you do is once you've created a functionality, you try and wrap it up into a library, place the library in the central location on your hard drive, and then all of the different uh, um, software that you develop, types of software that you develop that use that library, will link against that library, just like we link against standard input output.h or against the math library. Somebody has put a lot of work into developing the math library, compiled all of the, uh, all of the functions, uh, wrapped them all up, all the object files uh, corresponding to those functions into a library and placed it into a centralized location. That's what all you need to do in order to uh, compile the code that uses mathematical libraries, for instance, is to add include math.h a line at the top of your function. So how would we do the same? Let us uh, take it step by step. Let us first create a modified version of our hello code. Uh, namely, we're going to add hi.h and hi.c, which say hi instead of saying hello. So uh, we're going to say hi there. Uh, and the function that will do that uh, will be called say hi. So this is the header file, hi.h, and it is referred to uh, in our C file, hi.c. And that C file is where the body of say hi is defined. So it's sitting here. So let us create hi slash src and hi slash include directories, copy our code into those directories as before. So uh, this is what you're going to see uh, as a result, after you compile this code into an object file like we did before called hi.o. So hi.o will be sitting uh, at the highest level. Uh, the hi.h file will be sitting inside of include and hi.c file will be sitting inside of the src subdirectories. Now we can modify main.c to call both of these functions. First, we're going to say hello and then we're going to say hi there. But when you try to compile uh, this updated main.c, we're going to get a new error. That is because both hi.h and hello.h define exactly the same uh, uh, preprocessing derivative, uh, directive, foo. And uh, in order to avoid that, let us pick one of these files and rename to bar. Once we do that, uh, our compilation will go hopefully without a glitch, and we're going to be able to now run our main uh, function uh, in order to print out both of hello and hi messages. So now everything works. Uh, when we run the compile command, there are no more errors, and we can now run the executable and get both hello world and hi there printouts. Mission accomplished. But there is still a complication. If we have a complex piece of software with hundreds of C files, then we would have to list all these hundreds of C files in the command line, which will be really bulky. And what if we miss one of them? Uh, or include one that we don't really need? Uh, although that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, a way to avoid that is to bundle up all of those uh, object files together into one single library that you can easily refer to. And so what we can do for that, we can create a lib subdirectory and we're going to use a r command, uh, which takes all of the object files and bundles them into a single library file, which we will call libgreetings.a. And uh, you can, uh, once you have run this command, you can double check that the library file has, has actually been created by listing the uh, lib subdirectory. What is really important here is that you name your library starting with the lib, then the library name, and then .a extension. 
Uh, otherwise, the linker will not be able to properly uh, find the library file. And the way we teach it to find the file is uh, linking against the library. So minus L will specify a search path for libraries. And once you add the path to your library uh, in the search path, then uh, the linker will be able to know about it and look in there. And minus little l, we're going to use in order to specify uh, the library name, but this time without the lib prefix that we had to add in the previous slide. So here is how it works on this example. Uh, we're going to include uh, the uh, include libraries both for hello and hi uh, C files. Uh, and uh, then we're going to uh, list the main.c file, uh, the name of the executable. And all we need to do now is to specify the location of the library that we just created, the path to the library. In this case, it's a relative path. And uh, tell the linker that we actually would like to link against this library, uh, which we use the uh, minus L, the little l, switch for minus l greetings and this time we do not include the lib prefix and that is the end of magic uh, the magic being that we now don't have to recompile the source codes for our frequently used code uh, we can compile it once bundle it, bundle all the object files together into a library place it onto a centralized location, and now all we need to do is to have this extra little bit uh, in order to link against those libraries. Of course, we also need to include the header files as well, because otherwise the compiler will not know uh, how to call the functions. Congratulations, you have mastered C, and you can now spread the goodness uh, and share your powers with the rest of the world. Now, before we end the lecture, I wanted to um, go over a quick refresher of how to plot the results of your awesome programs. Let us start with the GNU plot, and then I'm going to do the same things in Python and to give you uh, an idea of how the two connect to each other. So in order to use GNU plot, you can either install it on your laptop or you can simply run it on the cluster where it's already installed. Uh, as I mentioned before, GNUplot GNU plot is not necessary at all, but many research groups use it, so I thought I would include it uh, as part of the curriculum. Uh, you don't have to know how to use it, so if you're not interested in that, you can skip it. Uh, so using GNUplot, we're going to look at the same temperature example as before. The data is sitting in this location, and of course there is a line break over here, so make sure uh, you remove it when you try to uh, copy that file. Let's now start with plotting the average daily temperature versus the number of the day, like we did previously. And uh, this is the command over here. I will not go over it. Uh, suffice it to say that we provide uh, first the uh, full path to the file, uh, the data from which we would like to plot, and we're going to list the x and the y axis columns uh, separated by a colon. You can also add an entry to the legend where you will entitle this particular uh, set of points that you printed. In this case, it will be average temperature in Fahrenheit. You can also plot other variables from the file, uh, which is the high and the low temperature, which are plotted in exactly the same way, except now instead of one colon three, uh, we're going to use one colon two or one colon four uh, to print the other two temperatures. We can plot the same exact thing, uh, but now uh, use lines to connect uh, the different variables. And for that, we'll need to add with lines uh, keyword. Uh, and that's all that's necessary uh, to do that. Of course, we can do the same thing with Python, uh, where instead of plt.scatter, we're now going to use plt.plot, which is uh, um, different from scattering that it actually draws the lines connecting uh, the various data points. And as before, uh, we can label each of the lines uh, by using the label keyword and use legend in order to show the legend uh, that lists all these keywords 
uh, and uh, shows the types of curves uh, that I used to plot those different uh, lines. You can also uh, add the X and Y labels uh, here and there, and you can use LaTeX notation. Uh, not all of the LaTeX notation, but the basic LaTeX notation. Uh, for instance, uh, you could use uh, a, an upper or lower index, uh, which comes in handy, or you can use a Greek letters like backslash alpha uh, will stand in for alpha. Finally, you can also save the plots uh, using the save fig function, where you provide uh, the name of the file and uh, it will automatically guess from the extension what type of file you would like. And you can, for instance, uh, indicate a PNG instead of PDF. Uh, so that comes in really handy if you would like to uh, produce plots for your presentation, for instance, where copying a PNG is easier. Uh, or if you want to include the figures into your paper, then PDF will probably come in handy so that uh, you can easily scale uh, the plot without losing quality. With GNU plot, it's a little bit more intricate how to save the plots. So you will start with set terminal PNG first. Uh, then after this, you will specify the name of the file, set output, in this case, temps.png, and all the commands that you execute after that are going to have their output written out to that PNG file. In order to indicate to GNU plot that you're done with creating the plot, uh, you're going to run either set terminal win uh, for Windows or set terminal x11 for Linux or Mac OS X, and you're done. You can also plot analytical functions uh, where um, this is a plot of a sign function, and you can see that all you need to do is uh, uh, you would uh, specify the x and the y labels, set the x range, and simply say plot sign of x after defining uh, the x range uh, from minus pi to pi. You can also define your own functions. Uh, for instance, uh, this is the way to do so. Uh, you can define the n of x function for the exponential decay of, of uh, nuclear species that we're going to talk about uh, at the next lecture. You can define both the normalization, the initial uh, number of uh, the nuclei, in this case a thousand, you can define the decay time scale or the folding time scale tau in this one, in this case one. Uh, you can define the x range for plotting, in this case from zero to 10, uh, and then you will plot this function. You can uh, also, of course, uh, switch to log scale, uh, add the grid and replot uh, using these commands. Uh, finally, you can uh, uh, use a script to steer a uh, GNU plot uh, by putting all of these commands into a file with the PLT extension and then uh, simply uh, give the PLT file as an argument uh, to GNU plot, uh, which will uh, then be able to plot it. In Python, you can do exactly the same. Uh, you can accomplish exactly the same by uh, using these commands, uh, or if you save them all to a, a Python file with a py extension, you can run that file by typing run minus i, uh, the name of the Python file. In GNU plot, you can get uh, the output in a window uh, if you add a minus persist switch or a flag to the command line to keep it open. Uh, and in Python, if the window doesn't appear, you can make it appear uh, by typing plt.show. So here you run uh, the source uh, script, uh, the script, and then here you show uh, the output. This is all that I had in, for, for today. And for the next time, uh, we are going to start discussing radiative decay and Euler method for integrating ordinary, ordinary differential equations. So uh, please start reading chapter one in computational physics and go ahead and start implementing the C code in section 1.3. And you can do that during the office hours uh, and the hackathon hours if you like. Thanks so much for your attention. I'm looking forward to seeing you very soon.